Okay, I'm firing up Management Studio to connect to these databases and get ready to do some triggered events. Oh, I'm using Express. I should have used 2014. I don't like Express. I forgot that I had installed Express. We'll just play with Express, see, see how different it is. And to connect, I will put in my server address. You would use the local host for yours. Oh, it doesn't like to connect to 2014. I cannot use SQL Server Express. All right. I clicked too soon. There we go. I thought Express would be nicer to me. And while I'm doing that, I will go find the little presentation I made for you. To walk us through this whole idea of s triggers. They sure pack a lot of information in chapter 8. A lot of, a lot of stuff there, so I'm happy to camp out there a little bit here. We'll move on soon enough, but I want to make sure you're familiar with enough things here. And I'm going to have you make your own trigger and your own start procedure. So we're going to add. Uh, those problems following the ones in chapter 8 that we just did. But let's look at this first. Let's think about how triggers work and how we create them. You could do all of this in your own programming code. You don't have to use triggers. The reason triggers are handy is because we let the database do the work instead of having to pull data out of the out of the table manipulate it update it make the changes where we're supposed to and and either make multiple SQL calls back to the database to have them update tables or send data to the database to replace things in a small database it's no big problem I can run queries but when the database gets larger and the actual transaction, if I did it on my local client, typically you're in a client server environment. Andy, could you explain what a client server environment would be? What am I talking about? Like multiple yeah, and the server could be out on the internet somewhere. In a, in a large database, and I have all these clients sending data back and forth, it's going to get crowded and slow. So rather than run the query, if it's something that needs to happen or that can happen on the server itself, I let the SQL code run. Another option to this, you don't have to run SQL on the server. You could run server-side scripts on the server that when you access the database and say, you know, I'm changing this value and that triggers a whole avalanche of other processing, you could have it run in another language that's a little more debuggable than SQL. That's one of our problems for SQL is trying to debug it. Even our simple procedures that I'm going to have you make, actually seeing whether they're working is not that easy. You have to do something that's supposed to fire the trigger and then go check the data that should have been changed by the trigger. And, yeah, and see if it actually made the change. And then, of course, if the change isn't what you expected, you have to go dig through the code and figure out, well, what went wrong? There isn't uh, breakpoints. It's, hey, did the code work? What change was made? It's a lot more difficult to debug. Maybe there is an environment out there on the server that actually lets you step through SQL stored procedures, but uh, I haven't found it. So we're writing, we're going to write some small triggers. So the neat, the neat thing about a trigger is you don't even have to write the code that tells it to run. 
it will automatically run based on the trigger you set. And the example they use in the book is uh, we have this customer database, or the project in the book, the problems in the back. We have a customer database, and we have this, what could have been a calculated field called the customer balance. And the customer balance is calculated from all the invoices, basically the sum of the, of the amounts for all the invoices that go with a particular customer. So the trigger that they want us to do is whenever an invoice has been added, update the customer's balance back in the customer table. Of course, we could have done that with our own code. Call a SQL, uh, uh, execute a SQL command that did a select invoice amount from invoice where customer equals the one I just updated. Then in my program, I could read through the results and add up all the invoice values and then say set customer balance equals this variable I just calculated. But we're going to let the database do that instead. And when you have millions of records and an operation could handle thousands of records that get updated, that's when the trigger happening on the server is going to save you time. If it's working, then my application doesn't need to worry about it. That's what I mean by less work for the application. If the SQL database gets programmed right and it does the work, I don't have to do anything about it in my application. I just see the customer balance gets updated whenever I add another invoice. But then if something goes wrong, have fun trying to figure out where in the code it goes wrong. So here is an example where we have an inventory. When, we, when an item is sold, the quantity on hand will go down by however many items were sold of that, however, yeah, however many pieces were sold. And if the order goes down far enough, I need to check, do I need to reorder? Do I need to set the reorder flag in my database? If the quantity on hand falls below a minimum, which should be stored in the parameters for that particular type of item. So lots of things can be going on here. I may do a query of the quantity on hand value, compare it to the quantity on hand minimum. If it's that's less than that, then I wherever the flag for reorder is. That flag for reorder may be right there in the inventory table, or it may be in a messages table that I say update messages table set or, or no, insert into messages table, set reorder where, uh, and then uh, for product, and then whatever product item this is. Another one, if I've got perishable items, when I've refreshed it, after throwing out the old perishables, I've received some new product that has an expiration date, I tell it, I update in the database the shelf removal date so the stock people can have on their list these items need to be removed from stock uh, next week but this will happen as soon as I enter new the new product into our uh, inventory those are all something that could be happening in a triggered procedure I'll call it a triggered procedure it takes a trigger event it's triggered and then automatic will update a few things if it's durable goods, it may, that may be based on my business strategy, that I don't want things getting dusty on the shelf. We schedule them for mo uh, moving to another place in the store, so customers think it's a, it's a new item when it's just been sitting getting, gathering dust. Maybe after so much time, even their durable goods, we move it to the discount table because we need to move inventory. It's not selling. Let's move it and uh, bring in new, new items. There's three kinds of triggers. If you just do a search on Google for Transact SQL, which is Microsoft SQL version, and you look for a trigger, you'll come across documentation that has a DML, data manipulation language. That means that something has changed in the table, inserted or updated or deleted, and the DML, the trigger, then should do something like update the customer, the items on hand, update whether the inventory needs to be sold, all that. The other kind of trigger that Microsoft explains is a DDL, data definition language. That means I've altered the structure of a table. 
or even some of the permissions to the table. Now, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have an example straight up for you on how that would how that would be triggered. Can you think of a of a reason or uh, something to do when a table has been modified? I've actually added a, or deleted a column from a table, or I've changed permissions of the table. Hmm? Yeah, I could do, automatically do a backup before I actually completed the query. I'm not sure if the trigger. I think the um, I am. I'd have to check. I think triggers happen be act at, before the actual. Uh, SQL is, is committed to make the change, but I'd have to check to be sure. It wouldn't necessarily matter, would it? Because it's going to get saved after, then it'll always be saved after, and you'll always have a copy. Yeah, so I'd have saved it yeah, after the previous change. Yeah. yeah, It'd just be a different time to look for. Another thing you might do, maybe you're just going to keep a log of transactions, things that have changed. So just even regardless of what, uh, you know, backing up the database, which would be a good idea, also saying, okay, this database was altered at such and such a time. I could even, I believe, in the in the triggers, you can actually find out who made the change, who was logged in and made the change. So logging and or backing up before committing the change. And then if you're keeping track of security, actually SQL has its own security. Remember, SQL has its own uh, uh, table of users and passwords and permissions you can uh, keep track of who actually logged into MySQL, establishing a user session, what database they connected to. So keeping track of security. Those are the three types. We're going to work just with a DML. DML. Something's changed in the table. So if you do, then, then go to the Microsoft site and look at the syntax for a trigger. Yes, it all makes sense. Good luck, but at least you see, and you can kind of just get the general ID. You do it. You do it. Create trigger. I do do trigger name, so that's familiar. I don't know what that's about. On a specific table, that makes sense. All of this stuff is a little bit, little bit confusing, but we know we're doing a uh, after update. We're going to do an after update, and. These kind of things down here just tell you I can do lots of things inside of there. I can, or, or I started with an as. I notice this is not in brackets, so I have to have the as. So if I look a little more carefully, I see I have to have a create trigger. I have to have a trigger name. I have to have the on something, one it's either table or view. That's what the curly braces are. Lots of optional items. It's got to be one of these three. And then I start with as, and then complete the trigger. Well, this is what I always look like, looked for when I uh, look through these do these documentations. I looked, I scroll all the way to the bottom, and say, okay, did they give me a working example? They didn't, so I built my own. This, I guarantee you, will work. But notice, I'm just doing a test, just just doing very simple. I'm creating a trigger called update age on the customer table where it's going to happen after an update. And here is the code that executes. One little query, set the age to one, two, three, four. Let's see if you can write this query and make it happen. And then we'll fix this to be what it should be. But let's just do this, a simple little query. I'm updating the age, and I know I can recalculate so I'm not wiping out data. Do the whole thing. You got to do the whole thing. So let's go. I'm going to go connect to Mangent Studio and put this in there. Yes, if you had a begin, you have to have an end. If you don't have a begin, you can just do, I, I think it, they can end it with a go. I've seen the, when I see their examples, I've seen just a go at the end. So I got to go find my management studio that I fired up, I thought, but I don't find it.
here. Where did it go? Oh, let me see if I can find it again. Management Studio. Oh, here it is over on the other page. Here we go. So I'm connecting to my database. I'm connected up to it. And I'm just going to start a new query that will do that create trigger. So I'm going to just start that and put that code right here in create trigger or, or, or uh, in a query. The first time you make it, just use the query to build it. And then I'll show you the shortcut once you've changed it and want to modify it. I just set it to a random number. Yep. Okay, so I go here and just start a new query. Create. And you don't have to be all caps, but I see that in the code. Trigger. And the trigger name, I'm going to call it update age. And I'm going to call it age2 because I've already written this once to make sure it worked. On the table, so the customer table, whenever an update happens, and I'm going to do as. I'm going to use the begin just because I like it. And then update customer set cust age equals one, two, three, four. End. Since I only using one table, I didn't really need the customer dot cust age. So to see whether this is going to work, I just execute this query that will create that trigger. Uh, yeah, F5 will execute. Oh, and I forgot I hadn't selected a database yet. So I'm gonna copy that code. I hadn't selected the database or tables. So now I'm gonna do select the database, do new query. Now it should work. Oh, it oh. Oh, I missed I missed the uh, code that I had. I forgot the tri create trigger part. That's what yeah. I was complaining about. There we go. And there. So this is my simple query. Let's execute. It creates the it creates the trigger at this point. It doesn't run that code. Okay. So now I know the trigger is created. Now watch what's cool about this. I can close this. Don't need to save changes. And I can go to my database, expand my database, look under programmability, and look under stored, or sorry, not, sorry, we're going to go to stored procedures. Sorry, look under tables, the table that I just created the trigger on, and I expand that, and expand triggers, and I should see my trigger in there that I just created. Now, SQL Management Studio gives you an easy way now to change it, I can right click, modify, and I see it's added a little code for me. But here, now that the trigger's there, I can do an alter trigger as I make changes to this. So I'm not going to alter yet because I have something that should work. How do I make this fire? I have to change something anywhere in my customer table. That's how it gets triggered, because I'd say here, notice here it says alter trigger yeah. on update. Update of anything in the table will cause this trigger to happen. So to make it change, I'm going to go just edit the top 200 rows of my customer table, because it's an update of the customer table. And see how it modified my code and put square brackets and my DBO object around it? That's how it prefers the language. So I, let, I leave that alone, even though I really didn't need to spell it, write it out that way. Go to my tables and right click, edit top 200 rows. Now, making any change in here should cause the update trigger to happen. So let's just for fun, I'm going to. Uh, I did, let's just change the name. Let's call it author2. 
make a change to his name. And if the trigger fires, I should see the customer age all get set to one, two, three, four. So I'm going to enter. Look at that. I, I see the immediate change reflected in that guy. Let me do a refresh by hitting execute or exclamation point. And I see that actually customer age got updated on all the records. Did you were you able to get yours to fire? It didn't, it didn't fire on all of them, it just did the one row that I ever did. Be sure to do a refresh. It should have it should have changed all of them. Re refresh your view just by hitting exclamation point here when you're in the view. Ah. Okay. It, so the view the view doesn't refresh entirely. That's, it, that's odd. It, yeah. it showed the one record change, yeah. but not all of them. It's kind of irritating. I wish I'd rather have nothing refreshed or everything, but it yeah. it just refreshes the row you row that you changed. Now let's make sure. Let's go ahead and modify it. Instead of one, two, three, four, I'm gonna update modify that trigger, and I'm gonna instead of one, two, three, four, let's set it to be five, six, seven, eight. I execute to update the trigger code by doing just execute the alter trigger. I go back to my customer table. I can just bring up the query that's showing my customer table. I'll make another change. I'll, I'll change his name back to our author. Uh, just execute it. And now, see, I see it got changed to 5678. I refresh this and I see, yes, indeed, it changed all of them to 5678. So I know my trigger is working. So that's a little crazy how you have to debug it. You have to, you make the trigger. Then you make a change to see if, to make the trigger fire, and then you go back and see did the change happen. Okay, so there's my. Let me enlarge this. There is the. Actually, I'll just put the code. All I did here for the trigger was that code there. Or I'll go back to this presentation. It has a little bigger. So this is all I did, and actually I didn't have to do customer.custage. So the two problems with this. It's inefficient because it changes everything in the table. If I have three customers, that's no big deal. But if I have a thousand customers or a million customers, I make one change and I sit and watch my database as it goes through automatically doing this very inefficient trigger. What I really only want to do is update the customers that were changed. Okay. Let's get that working for you. Is it working for you, Josh? Well, you're adding a new customer, so you're doing an insert, not an update. But let's see if it, I think it well, should fire the update trigger. Here has the one extra one, so this guy's still here. Then it's the first one. Now, did you execute that trigger? Or execute that word. The execute just sets the trigger. Go ahead now and execute that to see if the age got updated. Let's go ahead and, and change Ortega to something. That is editing. Change Ortega to add something like that. Okay? Now enter. Now hit enter. There. Now refresh. And then we see customer age got changed to one. So I know the trigger's fire. And that's the goofy uh, debug procedure with SQL. You can't do a breakpoint. You just have to say, okay, did this, did this trigger do what I expected? And I just put a goofy thing in there. So. And yours work? Yours is working? Okay. So now, now we'll move on. Let's let's see what we want to do next. Instead of just instead of changing them all, remember this is going to change everything because there's no where clause. How about 
we only select the customers that have been changed. Well, here's how we can make it more efficient. We add this WHERE clause, and as you read on their documentation, it takes a little digging or watching examples on Stack Overflow. You'll see they show you that there is a special table called inserted that actually contains just the information that's going to be updated or inserted. But it's called inserted. So now, instead of setting them all to 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm only going to set the customers that are in the things that have been changed. So adding this extra part now will only update the specific customer that I just changed. So I'm going to leave that code there and bring up SQL Studio and put it up to the top. So inserted is the word for whatever record they're setting. It's, yeah, it's actually like a table. Think of it as a table. Same structure as your table you're modifying. So in this case, it's the customer table. So inserted, you think of it, think of inserted as like a temporary customer table called inserted, but it has all the same columns. Just only the one record for, or one row, I guess. Yeah. I could be doing a multiple delete. But in this case, we're only doing one. But there are there are there are sequels that will do an update of multiple rows. This would get fired with multiple rows if I happen to be running a, a query that updated several rows. So I'm going to modify this guy and add instead of, well right now I'm doing 5, 6, 7, 8, I'm going to make that a different number now. Each time I'm going to make this different so I can tell that this new uh, modified trigger is still running. And I add the where cust num in, remember the in clause, very handy for taking input or taking having cust num take multiple values. Select select cust num from this special table called inserted. And remember this in clause where cust num is in, that means whatever shows up in the cust num in the inserted what's being changed row it'll sh it'll give me possibly multiple rows and now i put a different number here so i can tell okay yes this new trigger is is fixed has that added line so now i'm going to do a execute to to update my trigger remember remember executing this just updates the trigger code to actually make it fire I have to go and modify my table. And yeah. now the, the difference I'll see is I should only see the row that I modified get its age changed to this new value. So, um, do we have to change the name of the trigger? No, no. Because once you go to modify, it changes the create trigger to an alter trigger. Okay. So it does all that for you and adds this extra little code for you. Just a standard SQL. So it modified my code a little bit, but now gives me where I can fix all this. And and adding comments, feel free to add comments with a double with a triple dash. Uh, by Manny for eleven. Now executing this saves it. I go back to my table, make a change to our author again, and I'll make it change its name again. Hitting enter, I should see only that row get a new age. Let's do a refresh to make sure that's the only one that got the change and looky there I see that's the only one that gets changed because of my only update customers in this list that are the ones being changed. Now if I were if I were changing multiples I could do like a a update customers set the cust test uh, or the cust balance to be one more than it was. If I update multiple rows, they'll take on that new value. Any questions about that one? This where clause, very useful, but it's still a little bit inefficient.
because anytime I change any column in the customer table, it will update that customer's age. What column really matters? The only time I need to update the age is if they've changed the date of birth okay. field. Yeah. Yeah. Now, with our table, again, it doesn't matter with our tiny little table, but remember, a big table with lots of records, lots of columns, this will become very inefficient unless I trigger the update specific to only a change of one column. So add one more thing to this now, We're growing in sophistication in our trigger code. is to add, oh, I guess I haven't put it there. I can actually tell it on update of a particular field. Here we go. Now I add an if statement around this. I say, if update of date of birth, then do all of this. So I add this if statement around all of that using this special update uh, conditional that means only run this code inside of here if this has been changed, if that's been updated. And I'm going to change the code again to just so I can tell it's working. So I'm going to bring up this. And I'm going to add an if around that. And I'm going to change my number so I can tell which that it's actually making the change. So I'm going to go modify my code. Right, yep. Don't forget, There's a, since there's another begin, there's another end. So wrap that all in an if statement. If the cust, read this this way. If the date of birth field, cust DOB field, is changed, then begin this code. Otherwise, do nothing. You can have an else. And I'm also going to indent my code. That also makes it a little more readable. And I'm going to change the number to a different value, 2222. Two, two, two. So here's my new code. All I did was add the if around it, if update. Execute that to update my trigger code. Now go back to my customer table and change somebody's date of birth and see if their age gets a new value. So I'm going to go to Jean, Jean Smith's. I'm going to change her date of birth to 1980 instead of 1979. And I should see her cust cust age get changed to Two, 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 two. So I hit enter on changing her date of birth. And indeed, after changing her date of birth, I see hers change. I refresh the entire view of the table to make sure no one else got changed. And I, there indeed, I see only hers got changed. Now just again to be sure, let's go ahead and just change her name. I'm going to change her name to Smith2. Hit enter. Uh oh, I'm not going to be able to tell because it's already 222. Two, two. Let's change Juan's Ortega to hit enter. And his age should not have changed because although that row got a change, I didn't change the date of birth field, so it did not fire my trigger. And see how I'm debugging? Just changing something to a specific value. So I can tell whether or not it actually worked. Does that make sense for you? And again, when you approach query building like this, especially when you're just learning this, and even, even as you get better at it, do it in little pieces because it's not going to be easy to debug unless you find some really nice debugging SQL for, um, stored procedure debug. you got to do your own very careful debugging by making changes one at a time. Now. We want to now make the age to actually be what the age should be. Remember how we calculated the age? Yeah, it's date diff. 
I had to, with Microsoft SQL, I have to use date diff. So here I do date diff uh, cust dob date of birth dob. Oh, and I forgot the first parameter is d year. Oh, look at that! It gives me an autocomplete choice here. Look at that! So look at all those choices. I didn't realize how many, so many choices on date diff. So there's the year field. Oops. And the difference between cust, dob, and comma, sys date time, right? Yeah, there, sys date time. Love the autocomplete. Now, I won't see my date get updated unless I actually make a change to the date of birth. Yeah, S Y S D A T E T I M E. That works for you? Oh, oh, and I forgot the oh, empty parentheses. I forgot that. Now I let's see if I have it. I think if you have a syntax error, it won't take the alter. So if I have that bad, let's see what happens. Yeah. Yay. Empty parentheses, then execute. Now it's happy. So yeah, so you if, if you have a syntax error, it will catch it. And usually gives you a decent syntax, you know, decent error message to point to a little easier where the error is. Now I won't know it works though until I go back to the table and one by one just make a little tweak to the customer date of birth. I'll tweak hers back to 79, hit enter, and age got changed to 37. Make this 23, and his age got updated. Give him a date of birth. I just started typing where the star is. Just like in Access, I can just start typing here. Oh, when? Oh, I did that last night. I was playing with it when I was testing all this code. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, sir. I put my birthday just behind the name Daisy because it looks like it's going solely based off the year or rounding up. Yeah. I haven't had my birthday this year, but it's already saying. Oh. It, yeah, it's just going. But, like, is there a way to make it go? I, I guess since it's not technically counting ages of people in the computer sense, it's just measuring the distance of time. Yeah, in and years. Rounding in and rounding up and giving an answer back in years. Oh, okay. There is a way to do it. It's not that it's like, it's just like this boy and three. Well, and it's just mean, round you could call it like. It takes seven. My point is, it's several levels. Uh, uh, it leads to things to chat. So there's no like round like each, up. Each caller of the. You got a seven round. Um, let's see here. You could. You could. Remember what you have in your little query. Just could you do it by day and then divide by 365? Right. You could do. Because you can get sys date or you can get date diff based on years and then days. Uh, you could do. Yeah. You could do lot, all sorts of math. There's because remember, sys get date diff can go days, min, minutes, so you could probably get the year and then add uh, fractional date uh, day difference divided by 365. Okay. And remember, if remember what we'd have to do if we actually wanted to do that, we want to have fractional age we'd have to actually modify our design of our customer table because I believe age is a, set to be a numeric without any decimal. So we could change that to be 18.2 or 18, however many de decimals you want to carry. Or you could make it a, a, dec uh, oh, a, a decimal. Yeah, you could add multiple numbers after the decimal point. But if you wanted to do that, save actually save it in the database, you'd have to allow that. Right now, mine is just decimal 18, comma zero. All right, so let's. Uh, so now we have to trigger that. We haven't. I haven't triggered it yet. So I'm going to go edit the customer. Oh no, I did. I went and edited all of them, and I see now the age it's calculated. So I'll put in my birthday to 1961. 11 18, enter, and it calculates me as being a year older than I am. 
Yeah, so I see uh, it's doing the just the strict year subtraction, not even rounding. So the my age at the end of this year is what that's showing. All right, now let's see what else we want to do. Well, that that's triggered uh, procedures, and this is the part that you just did. You added this. And I think that's that may be, be the end of that presentation. Now, <laughs> stored procedure, pretty easy actually. Uh, the only more the only thing more complicated about stored procedures is they can take parameters. So let's do a stored procedure and see how they work. Uh, if it th well, it depends on what programming language you're using. Often it just throws away what's after the decimal. I did the divide by 365 over 2 by that worked fine without changing the data type. Yeah, it rounds it. And do you have it? It rounds down. Too. Oh, okay. That's what I was saying. So even though you're still storing it as an integer mm -hmm. by doing the divide, okay. All right, so now we're going to make a start procedure. Now, if you want to do it the confusing way, you can go down to your database and go to the programmability and do right click new start procedure and instead of giving you a blank sheet it gives you a template for a start procedure with lots of confusing things in there but it actually gives you an idea of what should go in there but it can be confusing so I'll, I'll show you a simple procedure and then you'll start understanding what this is all about. So let me take a procedure that I've created already called add a customer. And I'm going to right click and modify that start procedure and then show you my code. I'll show you what I did. I took the template and I will, I actually didn't fill in the template where I should have. I'm going to take that and I'll enlarge it for you, make it a little re more readable for you. I took that code and what I did, instead of throwing away the, the lines that were explaining it, I commented them out by adding three dashes in front of them. Just so I could tell, I could use those notes to kind of say, okay, that's what they mean. So let's look through what I did. Back at the top, first thing you do is you, instead of, when you're doing it the first time, it's create procedure, procedure name. So ignore that stuff for now. And this is all comments as well. So I'm going, to, I'm going to delete these comments to avoid confusion. So where's my create procedure, alter procedure? There it is. Oh, got to get going. So basically, when you're naming variables, you put an at sign in front of the variable name, and then what type it is. Just like when you're making a table, all those data types are valid with a comma and until the very last variable. So at variable name, type of data it is. And then your code, we'll skip the commented out stuff. We do have the as begin. Here's my, here's my query that I ran. That's simply inserting a customer based on the added or the past parameters to that stored procedure. We'll review this next time. We'll stop there because we got to get going before we get beat up.